during Washington's campaign of 1776 and 1777, Maidenhead was literally in a war zone with Lord Cornwallis and his British army camped in Princeton and Washington's forces located in Trenton. Scouting parties from both armies overran the village and the countryside foraging for food and supplies. The King's Highway, Route 206, was infested with American scouts harassing the British who at one point inhabited the village. The villagers suffered the tortures of war as even our church building, which was only 10 years old at the time, had been occupied by the British. Many of the women and children fled to homes along the Delaware, and some found refuge in the caves of the Sourland Mountains, while nearly all of the able-bodied men were in service with George Washington. For instance, the men of popular families such as Baker, Greerly, Hart, Marchand, Updike, Philip, Titus, and Van Kerr were all serving with General Washington. Washington was losing the war, and just when it appeared all was lost, there was a reversal in fortunes. Here to tell, about, tell us about this <clears throat> and how the local Presbyterians helped turn the tide of the war is Cop Captain Thomas O'Neill. Captain O'Neill, retired, is a 10th generation Trentonian. He was a graduate of Lawrence High School, captain of the football team and its quarterback. He's a decorated and wounded combat veteran, having served two combat tours with General James Mattis and the famous 1st Marine Division in Iraq. He received an honorable discharge as captain in the infantry. He has top secret clearance holder. He has spent the past two years conducting an on-site ancestral research. And we are very proud and pleased to have him with us this morning to tell us a little bit about what he has found in his research. I present to you Captain Thomas O'Neill. Wonderful church. It's great to be here again. Um, I am a proud graduate of 1992 uh, Lawrence High School, and I grew up here and was born in Trenton uh, in 1974. So what I've been doing over the past two years is, uh, along with my mother, uncovering this amazing story about one of the families that Bill mentions, uh, who are the Andersons, who I'm descended from. And this family, along with the Brearleys, Phillips, Bainbridge, and others, were critical in establishing this colony and then fighting for our independence by their efforts and then also the terrain of Maidenhead and the surrounding areas. Excuse me. Thank you. So um, in order to really understand that, we have to go back a hundred years from the American War of Independence. Um, and this is the title of our presentation, The Andros Legacy and how it enabled victory during the American War of Independence. Thank you very much for, for coming this morning. Our story starts in 1688, actually about 10 years earlier. This map really depicts the situation um, of, of New Jersey, which was at the time East and West Jersey, okay? And if you look here, it says, provinces under Sir Edmund Andros. 1688. This gentleman, Sir Edmund Andrews, controlled all of this area. Uh, and in 16, uh, excuse me, 1686, this dominion was created, and then New Jersey came in in 1688. So it starts with Sir Edmund Andros, an Englishman, son of Amos Andros, Andros, who was the bailiff of Guernsey. He was a staunch. His father was a staunch supporter of Charles I. Born in London, 6 December 1636. He was an apprentice to his uncle, Sir Robert Stone, who was, I'm going to take this off, uh, captain of a cavalry company, and they spent two winter campaigns in Denmark, and that included the relief of Copenhagen in 1659. He becomes fluent in French, Swedish, and Dutch. That's very impressive. 
And um, that will come into play uh, in the next 10 to 20 years as he becomes very sympathetic to Dutch interests in the colony of New Jersey and new de uh, the Dominion of the New England, the Dominion of New England, excuse me. He spends the entire 1660s fighting the Dutch as a major in so bias, uh, Sir Tobias Bridges' regiment of foot in Barbados. He's actually got an island named after him. And in 1674, he was appointed by the Duke of York as the provisional governor of New York. And he spends uh, the next 20 years, he's the governor of East and West Jersey, of course, the Dominion of New England, Maryland, and Virginia. And he's instrumental in King William's War. And I say he's instrumental because of his relationship with the Lenny Lenape Indians, which I'm sure many of us know uh, who they are. In 1675, the governor leads an expedition to Delaware Bay, and he signs a peace deal with the tribal chief named Rena Wickham. And it's the first of its kind in North America. This is the start of the covenant chain, if you're familiar with that, which is a series of treaties that enabled the, the settlers to get along with the Indians. Uh, and the, the, the friendly folks were the Lenapes, which are right in our area here. <clears throat> and uh, it's pretty unique that uh, Sir Edmund can go down there uh, to, and, and you know negotiate these deals. That enabled him to move about from the south up through Delaware Bay. He came in here with his forces. He got out, and this is a guy who went into Connecticut and would, you know, read a decree the king here died. He gets off a boat with his infantry. He says, you know, this is the king's land. He was a colonial administrator, that's what he did. And he's a great administrator. He, all he did was follow orders. And he got a bad rap for that because the king you know, was getting very uh, demanding in a lot of these areas that were getting very political because of commerce. Uh, so again, the Lenape Treaty was really a good move for Andros because he's now moved in from the south, from Maryland, and he gets to Trent in 1685, and he orders the construction of the King's Road there, and also looks at the defenses of the area. And that was really the first um, presence for the King in Trent, was, was right around that time. And at the time, the Dutch controlled Elizabethtown right up to the north here, and there was nothing connecting this area in here. There was an Indian trail, and the Indians up in the Watchung Hills didn't get along with the Lenapes. So nobody nobody came in. It's not like today where we get on the turnpike and we just, you know, get off in a couple exits. Nobody nobody ever went from here to here. Which is kind of interesting now that we're you know we've got all these uh, highways and things that can connect us. Um, so Andros goes back to uh, England to visit with King James, and I guess he's briefed uh, that the king wants some changes, and Andros, as governor of uh, New York, orders Governor George Carteret arrested, and he is beaten, and later dies after wounds. So he was the founder of him and Lord John Berkeley, uh, who again sold uh, West Jersey to a group of Quakers, which included Milan Stacy. That name's very important. And so is Dr. Daniel Cox. That's very important as well. Uh, he's the non-Quaker in the group, and he's the king's physician. So there's a geopolitical interest there that kind of contaminates the Quakers, if you know what I mean. He, although Cox lived in England, he never showed up. He was the actual uh, de facto governor of West Jersey, but he never even showed up. So he was managing the affairs in London, and he was very ineffective. The, it went bankrupt, West Jersey went bankrupt, there's all kinds of problems. And Andros, you know, and the king said, you know, you take control of everything. And he strong-armed his friend, George Carteret, uh, by having a company of infantry go to his house in Elizabethtown and snatch him up, and had his troops beat him up, and then he later died. Uh, and then, of course, you have the Dominion of New England created in 1686. New Jersey falls into that in 1688. So that's really what New Jersey looked like until uh, Enoch Andrus is born in 1668 in Elizabethtown. And he is a symbol of a unified New Jersey. His father, Sir Edmund, either had a girlfriend or had a first wife, might have been Dutch, but they were up in Elizabethtown and he has a child uh, who becomes a royal lieutenant who fought with the Lenapes in Albany during King William's War in 1689. So here we, we see a very close relationship again with the son 
of Edmund, who cut this deal with the tribal chief, going out and fighting. He comes back from the war with his two brothers, Joshua and Cornelius, um, and they are Dutchmen, but they are brothers because they all married the Updike girls, including Enoch, so I'm, I'm actually an Updike. Um, and they have a big farm in Hopewell that they did for a long time. But uh, that marriage and that unification, that um, demonstration of English and Dutch together was very unique. And Enoch, once that happened, used Presbyterianism to demonstrate that as well. Okay? So uh, he bring, comes and brings his brothers down here and they buy a property from Stacy, that Quaker, 600 acres, right along the Assipin Creek when it comes off the Delaware, on both sides of it, all the way up to Nottingham. It was on the other side of the meadow. This whole area was one big meadow, and this road here, which was the King's Road, went around the north side of the meadow, and then the south side, you had Nottingham on the other side, which had an Indian trail on it that we'll talk about a little bit later. And then Enoch and his friends, uh, Bainbridge and, and uh, Brearley, lived right down over here, in all this meadow, right off uh, Province Line Road. He's known as the overseer of the highway. He's a constable and a coroner, and he donates corner, excuse me, and donates the land and helps build all three of these Presbyterian churches: the one in Trenton, the one in Lawrenceville, and the one in Ewing. And under Enoch, Trenton grows in industry and infrastructure, tanning, farming, uh, which is wheat and hemp, becomes very, very uh, important for the king and the location of the fields in relation to the river and the roads are critical. Plus the grist mills that pop up along the Assapink Creek, uh, they're, uh, they create a turnkey logistical solution for the king to move all of his wheat all over the world. So the area is very important to him. And then we see uh, Andros become anglicized, the name Andros, and it's referred to as Anderson. So the 12 kids that he has, Enoch, with Trinity Updike, are then known as the Anderson family. And the first guy there is Captain John Anderson, who was a colonial administrator, probably the most powerful man in, in New Jersey in the mid-18th century. That started in 1727, where he received a commission in the Royal Provincial Militia to become the found commander of this company, Maidenhead, okay, of, the, of, the, of basically the police. And this was part of the famous 1st 100 Militia Regiment, which was made up of all of the local families here that we talked about earlier. And it was their responsibility to maintain security of the area. Um, so, you know, they were very powerful, these families. They, they controlled this militia, and the king had to use that militia to enforce security, so essentially they had the power. And Captain John continues to maintain his family's extensive real estate holdings in Hunter and Monmouth County, as well as in Cumberland County, Maryland. And that's because of Andrew, uh, Edmund had all that property down there as governor, and you know left it to Enoch. And then Enoch left it to John. John becomes a leader in this church. And he's buried with one of his sons right out here in this uh, backyard or graveyard, away from his other family members. And we'll, we'll talk about why in a second. He owned and operated one of the best taverns in the colonies right up here. And it's still there. Right when you leave here, you can make a left and drive down and go a mile. And you can see it on the right. It's the Anderson Brearley Tavern. And his residence, the big house, still sits there, the Anderson Kaplan House, on Brunswick Circle, still there. That's the highest terrain in the county, and it overlooks, uh, it's got clear line of sight to the Delaware River, and then north and east of New Brunswick. Um, and that was very important back then. So, in 1750, all of that came crashing down, because uh, Captain John, unfortunately, com commits a nefarious act, and uh, has uh, an affair with one of his prostitutes that works over at the brothel and has a child that dies and that act dishonored the Anderson name completely in 1750. It ruined everything for, for the family. Um, and and I, Bill and I talked, it might have actually kept us from being known as founding fathers because their best friends all became founding fathers. <laughs> 
So, anyway. Yeah. That's a good lesson learned. But when you drive out of here, go, go down and see that house. You can see the Bravo. It's a little stone shack. And you can say, wow, that screwed up everything for Tom's family. He could have been... You know. Anyway. Um, so in the early 18th century, Maidenhead really becomes the most powerful area in New Jersey and possibly the 13 colonies. Again, because of the location and the commodities it was producing. The wheat and the hemp, again, were getting stripped off of this land or farmed, packed in grist mills that are on the creek, put on a wagon, moved down to the river, put on a barge, sailed, floated down to Philadelphia, and then it's on a tall ship where it's going to India or wherever. I mean, that's amazing. And it was all happening here. And the families, the Brearleys, the families, everybody who owned that, became, you know, they and they had the, this militia, they said, you know, we have a lot of power here. What's the king going to do to us besides take his red coats and march us down, or march right down the, you know, the king's road and start bayoneting people? That would be very catastrophic. So the, the, the people here were in a situation where they had tremendous leverage over the king. And the king knew that, and he wanted to harass the populace, so he came up with this plan <clears throat> And remember Daniel Cox, we talked about him. Well, his son shows up in 1702, Colonel Daniel Cox Jr. When 1702, New Jersey becomes a royal colony and went bankrupt. Uh, and they, they, the, old, the, the men of New England went, went up after the Glorious Revolution in 1688. Unfortunately, Andrew survived that because he was such an effective administrator. He went from one king to another. And he said, you know, yeah, you know, so that, that's pretty impressive that Andros' service to the crown and his loyalty you know, made him kind of transcend that major rift between two kings. Um, says a lot about who he is. But Cox's son shows up and has this uh, statement where everything that his father sold to everybody was just quid rent, I believe it was called. But it was, but it was basically, you just have the right to farm it, you don't own it. So you can imagine, you know, being one of the families here that has been burying people on their property, maybe, and somebody shows up and says, oh, you know, you have to repie that back. Absolutely not, you know. People went crazy. They said, this is insane. And they started rioting and uh, having a revolt, essentially major riots. And, you know, and that all happened in 1746. Is, you know, up till then, for 20 years they had all these problems of, you know, people getting arrested and families going down to the sheriff's jailhouse in Somerset County, breaking everybody out. Edward, Edmund Bainbridge organized a mob of 200 people to break somebody out of jail. That's a lot of people. You know, they get everybody in their muskets, their pitchforks in their wagons, and they ride down to Somerset County, and the sheriff has them, but they can't do anything. So, there, it was essentially an autonomous colony. And Captain John Anderson, David Burley, and Edmund Bainbridge are elected to run it. And this is after the governor, governor Morris dies in 1746. He's a British governor, a pro-British, pro-Anglican governor. And everybody else is, believes in everything the opposite. And this gentleman, John Hamilton Esquire, who's an amazing patriot, whose father was also one of the first uh, I believe Hamilton was a governor after in the early 1700s. I think maybe Morris was poisoned because John Hamilton stepped right in and every, he signed off on three major pieces of legislature that supported colonial or the colonial interest, promoted the colonial interest. One was a new troll, complete control. Now it couldn't get called out by the king or anything, so you know they 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 wrote that in there. And then, of course, College of New Jersey. Jonathan Dickinson shows up in 1740, right around this time, with a new paradigm of Presbyterianism, if you will, kind of an um, enhanced version of it, if you will. Maybe move, It might have been more fundamental, because around this time, all the names are changing, the E from Ezekiel and all this other stuff. So it sounded like it's, a, it's, hard, to, it's hard to understand what that new light was. But it was a fresh new thing that all the families here were, were supporting. This church was supporting. And this gentleman, Jonathan Dickinson, started the College of New Jersey, the Princeton University. And that would not have happened without 
the, the, the people in this church. Okay, so you have Lawrenceville Presbyterian Church, a big part of the reason why Princeton University was created. So that's something to be very proud of uh, as well. But the families all pulled together and they fought against um, this tyranny, if you will, or this harassment. Okay, and unfortunately everything was going just fine until once again John Anderson did that horrible thing and, you know, the family just kind of, I don't know what happened, but Ezekiel, his two sons ended up going to another church, so it, it, it really did a number on them. So the colony, again, is autonomous until 1755, which was when the outbreak of the French and Indian War, that's when that happened. And John's two sons participate in that war. His oldest got the commission, Ephraim, born in Maidenhead, and Private Ezekiel, born in Maidenhead. They went down to Court, Fort Cumberland, or Cumberland County, where they had land holdings, and they signed up to fight for General Braddock in an attempt to capture Fort Duquesne from the French. And during that operation, militias from Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Maryland were called into action to support the doomed Braddock expedition. And his aide de camp is somebody by the name of George Washington, 22 year old farmer from, and a lieutenant colonel. And he's enamored with Edward Braddock because Braddock is this giant of a man who's, you know, the head of the British Army in North America. It's huge. And you have this 22 year old lieutenant colonel that's riding along with him and giving, you know, little tidbits of information, advice on how to employ the militia and the Indians. George Washington was an excellent. Um, guerrilla fighter, you know, before he, too, he kind of, that all uh, permutated into a, uh, the best maneuver general that we've ever had here in, in the New Jersey campaign during the War of Independence. But that uh, expedition was decimated. You know, the, the French uh, infantry and the Indians had been lying in the woods waiting for Bragg and his ego to kind of march up with everything in line, and they just tore him to pieces, you know. And uh, Braddock was killed. He was shot in the chest. And George Washington had to manage all of that bedlam. You know, the dead division commander, <coughs> and then organizing the retreat. And he gets two musket holes in his jacket that day during doing that. Um, and they got everybody back for, to Fort Cumberland, Maryland. They buried General Braddock along the way, and once they get to Maryland, the militias detach, Washington goes back to Virginia, but the King's Army retreats back up right through here, guys, right on that road, you know, and either Ezekiel was hanging out, his brother were hanging out in the, the place in, in Maryland, or they might have followed them up here and kind of got off the convoy as the defeated brigade moved back up to New York. Um, it was a disaster. Huge success for the French, obviously. And the lesson learned there was General Washington had told General Braddock, excuse me, Lieutenant Colonel Washington, Sire, you must fight like the Indians, or else we're going to get killed. And what Braddock said, no, we're, we're going to fight like gentlemen. <laughs> and they died like gentlemen, unfortunately. It was awful. So uh, <clears throat> that concludes the brothers' service in the French and Indian War. Uh, but it starts a 26-year relationship with George Washington, and it picks up again in 1776 in Maidenhead, which, as Bill mentioned, was an absolute war zone on the front line, right here at that road, this church. In 14, on the December 14, 1776, is when we first saw the war come, come here, and that was when a Hessian, Hessian regiment under Colonel Raw, moved into the area of operations, moved into the area to start conducting operations. Brutal people, big people, compared to who we had walking walk around. There was a story of one of the families that was living down in Trenton, who were just sitting in their house trying to keep warm, and the door kicks open, and these, you know, like six giant people come in with giant women, and they just you know, imagine that. You know, you're in your house and these people come in and they speak German, you speak English. And they try to have a conversation. One of the big women takes one of the 
a trinket or something, and somebody grabs for it, and the woman takes her shoe off and smacks the woman right in the face. Comes into your house and does that. Well, that wasn't going to fly for too much longer with the patriotic Whigs that were living in this area. Since, you know, since, you know, again, we read the first Declaration of Independence on 8 July was by Samuel Tucker in Trenton. It was the first time somebody got out and actually said that aloud, and that happened here in Trenton. We were Whig leaders. Washington, General Washington knew that. The towns along the river, all Whigs, Trenton, Hopewell, and Maidenhead was the most important because we sit on the high ground, folks. That's why we're important is because the river goes down and, you know, back in those days, you had to walk everywhere and, you know, it's, it makes, you know, a lot of sense to have your stuff on the high ground. And then it goes flat out to New York. So um, the, the town, its uh, elevation was just, you know, perfect for that. Colonel Rawl immediately gets attacked the day that they arrived. And from one of his officers wrote in a journal, ever since we got to Trenton, we have not slept one night in peace since we came to this place. Harassing attacks by the first hundred in militia on supply lines, okay? Uh, he actually, he, he sends a request up to his commander Colonel Carl Von Donop and says, we need a British regiment to occupy Maidenhead. That's really, really uh, serious. That's like 500 uh, soldiers. And because this area was so bad, you had guys shooting from the tree lines, the, the Colonel Ross said, you gotta give me more reinforcements in Maidenhead because they're really doing a number on us. Meanwhile, these soldiers are walking around these Hessians, they're raping our women. Okay, and people like Captain Ephraim Anderson, Ezekiel's older brother, John's oldest, who was burned doing a private secret mission for George Washington in the Battle of Quebec. He was put together these fire ships with about 20 of his guys, spent six months building these ships and putting combustibles in it. And he sets off on his plan to go bomb the British fleet in uh, Quebec Harbor. And the British found out about it from spies, and they put a cable across the entire river the night before, and they didn't even see it, and the whole, the whole fleet smashed into that cable, and poor Ephraim's ship exploded, and he got blown out of it on fire, and he lands in the water, and he you know, swims to safety, and he comes back to his 240-acre plantation on, the, on Delaware, which is now New Jersey Manufacturing Trenton Country Club. That was Enoch's property he left to John, who then gave it to Ephraim, which ended up immediately, right after he got wounded, he lost the estate. The sheriff came and took, you know, everybody was losing money. Trying to survive the war, you know, they had their sons going out and fighting, and then they had to farm at the same time. I mean, really tough. So, again, Maidenhead was a very bad place for the Hessians and the British. You had General Cornwallis who was moving down um, to eventually crush General Washington. His mindset is, where is he going to go? He's going to go right up against the river. We got him. And we can basically just take our time here against the old fox, is what he would call him. And he underestimated General Washington considerably on every occasion that he faced him. He was embarrassed every time by George Washington. Um, and we'll talk about that at Yorktown as well. Um, so this town right here, the town that this church and that you come to, was uh, major harassment for Henry Clinton and the commander of the British forces in North America and the king. All right, and, and we have a desperate continental army of 2,400 who's been beaten and the weather's awful and the enlistments are running up and there's just no money to sustain it and there's very little hope but the men of Maidenhead provided that hope, and uh, it manifested during the battles of Trenton, Princeton, and a skirmish at Short Hills. Okay, and as we know, the Battle of Trenton, we're not going to go into detail of these battles. We can talk about it if you like when we have the Q&A, but we're going to talk about the terrain here that was owned by Enoch Andrews, which was given to John and then handed down. But the terrain that they lived on 
All of these battles were fought on family property. Even when they staged the Yankees, and our family lawyer, as I mentioned before, had a family tree that said this guy, Ezekiel Anderson, was a pilot for Washington's boat across the Delaware, which makes sense after he served with them at the French and Indian War, and then we had all these land holdings. Specifically, Washington Crossing State Park, one third of that is Anderson property. So when they got off the boats, they moved up to the high ground and they got staged. They took the Continental Trail, which goes through one of the Anderson farms, and they marched in Trenton. And when they got down to uh, Trenton, it was a massive uh, success. The second battle of Trenton, which occurred in the 2nd of January, and by the way, the reason that General Washington, everybody says, wonder why General Washington left Trenton the first time. Does anybody know? I'll open that one question to somebody. Anybody? It's because he didn't want to have his men get drunk at the taverns of Trenton. <laughs> True story. He said, you got everybody out here because in about an hour, everybody's going to be hammered and we're not going to control these Yankees. Um, so those trend bars can be dangerous. Uh, and so he moves everybody back over and he decides to come back and exploit the situation. He, and Washington has made a career in, so far of just maneuvering away from the British and striking when he can. He was a raider in the truest sense. He would raid things, hit and move. And he's going to use that during the Second Battle of Princeton, right here, this road, and the creeks. A historian could actually say that the creeks of Maiden had saved America. You couldn't make that argument. The Shippetalkin and Shabakung Creek are tributaries off the Assapin Creek, off of the Delaware. They come north and northeast. And the farmers made, had great success farming this area because of those creeks. In addition, those creeks were used by Colonel Edward Hand and his guys to hold up the advancing British convoy by General Cornwallis that was marching down the King's Road to go get the general and his men who were in a defensive position on the south side of Acid Pink Creek. Again, property owned by Enoch Anderson. And they were kind of waiting there. Washington then decided, through intelligence, it wasn't just one, it wasn't just Ezekiel Anderson, it was all kinds of people that talked to him. But then it was Anderson's property, which is now Greenwood Cemetery, that was used to move the entire Continental Army around the meadow, right over here. So it was a shell game, essentially, where Cornwallis is marching his people down here. The delay actions here, if you take this road, go right down to the creek, down the street, it's right there. That's the creek. They would fire and then use the creek to maneuver. You know, they could run in the creek, you know, quickly back into this area. So the creeks were great to move forces out of that, out of that position. And then he, Colonel Hand delays essentially all the way down to 7-Eleven, to that creek, which is the Shabakum Creek. That's property that was on John Anderson's estate right there. Those were brilliant, successive delay operations. Brilliant. And they hung up the advancing, very powerful redcoats. And when that happened, General Washington and others, through intelligence that was gained by Colonel or Joseph Reed and all those guys that were doing reconnaissance on the horse and the horse the cavalry. They did a great job. But it was the men of the first hundred and militia regiment that made it happen. And again, those families that were here as part of that militia. Ezekiel was a still a little private, but he was a scout. You know, Ezekiel was a colonial scout. And he was he was meant to be a private, whereas his brother was now a major. I guess he was the adjutant for the first hundred and before becoming a company commander in the second Continental Army. Okay, and right around this time, 76, 77, and it was when all the militia guys took oaths to become Continental Army guys. So right after the Battle of Princeton, the hundred and militia became the second Continental Army. John Lamb, Ezekiel Anderson, and Elias Phillips, all maidenhead men. Actually, John Lamb was, I think, from Trent, but they were all friends. They were the guys who conducted the Continental Army to Princeton. There was an Indian trail that went from Trent on our family property, and it was muddy and had all this other stuff, and it, it, 
can we move the army on that terrain? Yeah, there's a trail there, but is it, you know, can I move cannons? Can I move horses? And all those things had to be talked about. And Ezekiel was one of the guys that was providing counsel. And General Washington, based on everybody's uh, analysis, because I, I want to be careful here, because I, a lot of people, uh, you know, tend to think that this was just one guy doing something that was definitely a team effort. And it was the 100 militia that sustained the Continental Army and provided the security and the logistics, you know, and this people from Virginia or Pennsylvania, they don't know about this place, but, you know, Ezekiel and the families, the Phillips and everybody <clears throat> did a great job of that. And what a success that was. They, they got it, the whole, the Yanks, they caught them right off guard. And it was one of the most brilliant maneuvers in the history of our military. Uh, and it shattered three regiments, the 40th, the 17th, and the 55th. And these are the premier regiments of foot for the King of England. And you've got these, some even came like barely clothed col colonists, you know, with pitchforks and rifles. Some guys had bayonets. It's just uh, the cannons that were used that were fired, grape shot, into the British during that battle were very decisive. And the only way that they moved those cannons was because the ice had frozen the mud along the way. Uh, if it didn't, the cannons would have got, if, the, if, the, if it was warmer out, the mud would be very significant and the cannons would not have been able to move and then the cannons would not have been able to fire and we would have lost. So when you think about how sensitive that situation was, the variables that went in our favor, and because of that victory, everybody then raised their hand, they took enlistments, the French got excited about things. You had a French general that was actually in charge of um, that little Edward Hand. There was a French brigadier general that was the commander of that force that was fighting down there, and he got drunk before any of the battle. He got really intoxicated, got on his horse, and just drove off, rode off the train. And Colonel Hand's like, okay, well, I guess I have to leave these guys, his own guys, and he did great, and saved America as defense of uh, the landing actions. Unfortunately, Captain Ephraim Anderson, who I believe was sitting out, he, did, he was conducting those supply attacks on Hessian supply lines with his guys, but I think he was sitting out from Princeton, he was killed in action six months later during the Battle of Short Hills. He had taken over a company, and there was a skirmish. Washington was in the hills out there, and it was kind of there, and uh, Clinton was testing the waters, and there was a little skirmish, and Ephraim was struck down by grape shot. Uh, and so he was a captain from Maidenhead who was killed in action. And, uh, you know, I guess he was probably the first casualty of Maidenhead, maybe one of the first casualties. Those men, those proud maidenhead men, and how it morphed into the second New Jersey Continentals, they did incredible work at Yorktown. And we don't talk about this enough. And I just went down to look at this battlefield and I realized, well, wait a minute, the second New Jersey was the main effort during the most critical part of that battle. And once again, General Cornwallis was down there and he was embarrassed by General Washington who used French naval support and infantry to support a robust ground attack on these redoubts, which are coastal fortifications. These are little spiky looking forts that people can retreat into and then fire cannons, you know. Um, and that's what had happened was uh, there were several of these redoubts along the cliff and then uh, a cliff line, a shoreline, and then below it was, on the shoreline below was, and uh, the Yankees had surrounded them and the French Navy had come up and it was just a beautiful, well, it wasn't beautiful, there was a lot, it was messy, but it worked. Um, and Cornwallis was, uh, you know, the second New Jersey was handpicked by General Washington, and it was led by Marquis de Lafayette. This task force of New Jersey men was ahead of Lafayette, and his subordinate commander was Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Hamilton. Those two men, led the charge of the 2nd New Jersey, Ezekiel Anderson was with him, and John, Colonel John Lamb, who was a guide four years earlier in 77, was now a colonel and was commanding the 2nd Continental Artillery Regiment 
which was critical in providing supporting arms to the infantry during that attack. And those men charged in there through the use of engineers. They, they dug, uh, dug trenches along the way and they hit and concealed themselves in the trench and they got into the, one of those redoubts. They knocked it out and they turned the cannons down onto the beach and they shot into that little town and Cornwallis and the staff. They retreated into a cave and then they flew the white flag shortly thereafter and they surrendered and Charlie Cornwallis was so embarrassed that he didn't actually surrender his sword to General Washington. He had his chief of staff, Charles O'Hara, do it for him. So that moment ended the war. That action right there, the second New Jersey to Yorktown, it saved us. That was the final objective of the war. And two weeks later, I guess uh, King George threw the towel in. So those men, the second New Jersey, this church, this men all belong to this church. And it was the center for colonial life for a hundred years. Um, and, you know, I've just been so blessed to have been able to uncover this story. And I'm really thrilled that I had the chance to come here and talk to you today about it. Okay. And I'd like to uh, dedicate this uh, presentation to my mother who passed away three months ago. She was critical and the discovery of all of this, and she's a descendant of Sir Edmund Andros. So I'd like to now open up any questions that you might have. I'd like to clarify the home that John Anderson lived in with the bordello out the back is on the corner of Route 206 and Hendrickson. It's the big white house on the right. Uh, the prep school refers to it as uh, Belknap. Uh, but anyway, that's the house. And behind the house is a stone, little stone building. I thought it was a smokehouse or something, uh, but really had other uses. <laughs> the, uh, the British Army would come down here all the time for you know, 75 years, and the tavern became known as a place where British officers could relax and have very nice, beautiful company. It was known, it had that kind of reputation for a number of years. And I started when Enoch died. When the father, when Enoch died, this, then John had started this corruption. And he was not very well liked. His family members didn't like him. That's why he's buried alone right in the cemetery with, it, with his son from a marriage or whatever with one of the women that he was work, had worked for. And he actually left his son to a house, his house negro named Prince. So this uh, Captain Anderson had a house negro named Prince who was very powerful <clears throat> and was you know basically walking around representing um, Captain John Anderson. Of course, the slavery component, which was active here in New Jersey, and the Andersons probably had slaves working in, in the plantations, but when you had John and Captain John Anderson had this person, Prince, you know, it, it demonstrates that, uh, yeah, sure, it was awful what happened, but still colored black Americans could still become very influential and have, you know, power. Uh, and John left his son to him when he died, which died, his son, that 16-year-old died mysteriously shortly thereafter. But there's a lot of uh, very interesting um, details that you can spend hours wondering, you know, what happened. But John screwed everything up, is what happened. Captain John Anderson. So, any other questions? Yes, sir. So, you mentioned the down by the 7-Eleven, which is just uh, south of uh, Notre Dame High School, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. I, you mentioned, I thought that was the Acid Pink Creek. I guess it's not. Well, it's a tributary of the Acid Pink Creek. So the Acid Pink Creek runs off the Shabbat, that's called the Shabbatcombe Creek. And that comes off of the Acid Pink Creek. If you got the Delaware River and then uh, the Acid Pink Creek, and then you have two spurs off of that that run into Maidenhead. 
there's a there's a plaque over there that some sort of battle battle of the asset bank creek. Well, can you talk about that a little? Like what happened there exactly? That, that there's you know there's a little blue I think it's blue plaque that's right at that little tiny bridge there. Where they, where yeah, that's they, correct. Like, what exactly? There? Sure. Well, I think the confusing part is it's known as the Second Battle of Trenton or the Battle of the Assapink Creek. So, what you were looking at that plaque was this was the Battle of the Assapink Creek or the Second Battle of Trenton. What happened was that gentleman that we were talking about, Colonel Hand, he started down here. There's another bridge down here that has a very similar plaque that you can see. So, from that bridge all the way to that creek, the two creeks were used to delay the British. So we think about the creek itself, that it jammed up the movement of this large force that was moving down the road. And Washington is basically saying, you know, where are they? Where are they? Oh, they're coming down. You know, everything's being timed sequentially to release the Continental Army away from Trenton as they're coming down the road. They're hanging them up. Washington's down in Trenton. They're up here with Princeton. Yes, sir. You're yeah, right. It's like th somebody throwing stuff in the way of, you know, just <laughs> slow them down as much as you can. And they did incredible. They just did awesome. And more deception from Washington. While they're doing that, he left a small force in Trenton yeah. on the other side of the Assapin Creek to make little fires and people start banging with wood, with shovels or picks or whatever <laughs> to, you know, make it sound like they're digging in. When they're gone, you know. <laughs> Wasn't there another? The Assapink Creek is the one that they're now going to uncover, which goes past Mill Hill. I heard that. And we will, we will now be able to see actually where all of that took place, because there were all kinds of uh, companies that did the, the linen and the you know the cotton and the what you talked about the wheat and everything. There were actually. Uh, uh, Shops that did that all along. Oh, sure. Yeah, that Assapin Creek was, was a huge, uh, huge place to make money. It was one of the only places to make money. Again, you put a grist mill on the creek, which enables crushed wheat, and then you put it in a bag, and you have somebody put it in a car and go down to the river and put it on a barge. It's brilliant. It goes right down to Philadelphia. It's great. We could use that now in the city. We could try to revitalize the infrastructure of the city with all the traffic that's happening all over New Jersey. Put people on boats and take, you know what I mean? Like, well, that's why, 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 that's why William Trent built this house there, because the shipping was before the falls, the last place before the falls of the Delaware River, whatever they call it. That's right. You couldn't take any boats really up there. They had ferries up there, yeah. but you know you had to stop there. That's, that's a great question, by the way. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah, uh, when, if this is after George Washington crossed the Delaware, is, is this the time period when they crossed the Delaware, they were down to Trenton? Yes, yeah, within, within a week, within a week. And that's what they were trying to do, head down there after he had come. Yes, sir. It starts, and that's a good question, because for somebody that's been reading it, it's easy. Well, but think 14 December 1776, the first time this area saw any bad soldiers, Hessians. They came in here, they occupied Trenton Barracks. And they started really doing these harassing patrols, going into people's houses, raving people, unfortunately, so on and so forth. And they eventually were attacked by a deceptive attack by General Washington when we crossed the Delaware on 26 or 25 December 1776. We crossed over from Newtown. Those Hessians were hanging out in there. And they gave them bad intelligence. And got her, people were drunk, and you know, the commander, oh, they're not going to attack. We did. At night, again, very unconventional. Marching, they crossed the river, they staged Washington Crossing Park, and on the 26th, they attack in a Trenton. Major victory. Washington then goes back across that day to Newtown because he's concerned his guys are going to get drunk. I'm serious, you know, and he, he got it back, and from that point, he's like, okay, now what do I do? And it was just reacting to Cornwallis at that point, because he knew Cornwallis was going to be raging mad, and he was going to come down from New Brunswick and Princeton with all of his forces, okay? Stony Brook Creek was the boundary between the British and the, and the Americans, really, and Maidenhead, this town, was the first demonstration of a Whig 
populists. Whigs were supporting the American cause, and Tories were, and Princeton were supporting the British cause. So, um, to get back to your point, after the attack at Trenton, he goes back to Newtown, Newtown, and then Cornwallis starts coming down this road, and these little delaying actions within the next week, essentially, patrols, and then major action on the 2nd of January, so a week after the Battle of Trenton, Cornwallis is now coming down to get him. And the stuff that happened at 7-Eleven and here by these Pennsylvania riflemen, their, their whole intent of those operations was to slow them down and tie them up so I can quickly move my guys out the back door to Princeton. And I can certainly talk more if you like, but I guess more to yes, sir. Wasn't there a delaying action before that corner of Road and Darrell Lane. Yeah, Darrell Lane down, and yeah. that's that's part of what this gentleman's talking about. This the Acid Pink Creek, that creek down there, the Shadow Cone Creek. And then there was another one by Notre Dame. Yeah, there, there was. Yes, there was successive. There was yes, part of the. Of, I look at that whole thing as the whole thing meaning when it started down here at this bridge, it was just a. Beautiful operation of uh, keep falling back, keep falling back, you know. It's really impressive, actually. Anybody else? Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, there are several people uh, I'd like to acknowledge. Certainly Thomas O'Neill, and he has a wealth of knowledge. His problem today uh, was trying to hold it short. And uh, because he could go on for another two or three hours with no problem at all. But we are very fortunate uh, to have someone whose family goes so far back in the origins of the population of this area. Uh, and he's done a lot of great research, and so we're very pleased to have you, Tom. Also, uh, Steve Jinjo, who has been taping, as an old fashioned word, videoing the presentation. Uh, Steve is a retired teacher from Chapin School. He is a technical wizard and a uh, wonderful photographer, and so we're pleased that Steve was here to record uh, this moment. Thank you all for coming, uh, and uh, we hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you uh, a year from now in another History Sunday. I wanted to say I think Bill Schroeder also deserves a hint of applause for his work in making this happen. Yes. Oh, yeah. um, so thank you, Bill. And uh, thank you for keeping this alive as we uh, celebrate.